Hello, and welcome to the Future Christian Podcast, your source for insights and ideas into what it means to live as a follower of Jesus in the 21st century. At the Future Christian Podcast, we talk to pastors, authors, and other faith leaders for helpful advice and practical wisdom to help you and your community of faith walk boldly into the future. Here's your host, Lauren Richmond Jr. Welcome to the Future Christian Podcast. My name is Lauren Richmond Jr. Reverend Jonah P. Overton, they, them, is a community organizer, creator of the podcast Jonah and the Peacock and Christian Queries, and the lead pastor of Zao MKE Church in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. As a young queer and trans clergy person, Jonah has been called into ministry to build the church as queer space and organize communities and churches toward justice and liberation. All right, welcome to the show, Reverend Jonah P. Overton. Thanks so much for being here, and uh, thanks for your time. Share, if you would, anything else you'd like to share with our listeners. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you for uh, the invitation. It's really lovely to be here. And um, yeah, I just, I, uh, I'm a church planter. It is my passion to start and cultivate new communities and expressions of faith, um, and particularly uh, with an emphasis on relationship, story building, and the ways that collective community can have this monumental impact on the world um, when we can organize around the principles of the gospel. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Uh, share, if you would, kind of about your journey of faith, what that looks like, uh, what that looks like today, what that looked like in the past. Yeah. So, um, I grew up uh, in a mainline Protestant uh, denomination. My dad was a Lutheran pastor, um, but mm-hmm. it was a really progressive, you know, so he was in the ELCA, which is a very progressive form of Lutheranism. Mm-hmm. And I had some um, just uh, incredible examples of faith from the margins from the very beginning of my life. I... Um, one of my godmothers is queer and a clergy person, and so that kind of taught me from the very beginning in the late 80s um, that queer people were not only blessed by God, but often called by God to do the work of the gospel and church building. Um, I also had a, a pretty profound experience um, just watching, observing my dad as a kid um, when he went to um, El Salvador with a number of his clergy colleagues to protect the Lutheran bishops there. There was a lot of um, political violence and danger. Um, But essentially, it was, you know, the U.S. militarism terrorizing poor villages. Yeah. Yeah. And and so I I learned from a very early age that following Jesus might take you to another country, to another place, to another people, um, to stand with the, the poor, the vulnerable, and the marginalized. And so those were really profound experiences for me. But I also then, you know, I, I grew up in Chicago and then in the suburbs of Chicago, and my experience of church community was a little bit different. Um, mm-hmm. I never quite fit in. Um, I was experiencing um, trauma and um, mental health issues as a teenager that I couldn't mm-hmm. really square with my experience in the local church. Mm-hmm. And so I... I left the church. I wanted to have a faith. I remember having a conversation with my parents when I was about 15, basically yeah. saying, you know, I want to believe. I respect your belief. I don't have it. Um, hmm. And so I I want to be honest about that. It just didn't yeah. feel real to me the way that it honestly did very much when I was a child. Um, huh. I was a really spiritual kid, but I went through this kind of valley um, in my adolescence. And uh, that valley was, you know, it was... It was dark. <laughs> I yeah. uh, experienced um, more trauma and substance abuse and, um, you know, just some real, real depths in my own mental health. And, you know, uh, I found my way back to a spiritual path and basically came to believe that the only way that I was going to survive um, that experience was connecting to God. And mm. so, I, so I threw myself wholeheartedly in my late adult, in, when I was about 19. Mm-hmm. into the church. I found actually some church plants um, and campus ministries, which are not unlike church plants um, in many ways, yeah. but yeah. ministries that were 
um, kind of making and remaking themselves, um, often with young people, including young people in recovery. Um, and that was really powerful. Um, but it was also a very different experience of church for me because these were um, mostly white, evangelical, non-denominational spaces. Yeah, and so yeah. that expression of faith was very different than, you know, the the kind of Lutheran uh, mainline experience I had had already. So I really came of age spiritually among evangelicals. Mm-hmm. Um, theologically and philosophically, I I had a very different set of ideas, but in terms of spiritual practice, the the tenor of worship, the emphasis on um, kind of an intimate incarnation, yeah. Yeah. that that all is very evangelical in me. Um, yeah. As I came into my own identity, though, in my early 20s, I actually, <laughs> because I felt like I had such a, such a different theological and biblical perspective than my communities, I was like, I, I would like to go to seminary. I want a theological education because I don't think that I'm learning in my local church what I what I desire to learn. Mm-hmm. Um, so in my early 20s, I went to seminary for the first time, um, but I was also getting a degree in social work so that I okay. could yeah. Yeah. work out in the community because I, I literally had no, no concept that there could be a place for me in the church vocationally mm-hmm. or professionally. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was coming into my own identity as a queer and trans person, as a non-binary person. And so I was like, <laughs> the church has no idea what to do with me. They yeah. don't want me, but I want to learn. And so mm-hmm. I studied theology. I started doing community organizing um, with a number of congregations across the city of Chicago. And uh, I was working with more than 70 churches. And I didn't wow. feel like there was a single one that I could fully be myself in. Mm. Um because at that time, you know, I was like, well, I am, and I was deeply involved in, in justice organizing and kind of leftist justice spaces. And so I was like, mm-hmm. I am a radical leftist, queer and trans evangelical Christian hmm. and with a seminary education. Yeah. So like, where do I go? Who is, who is my people? Like, where's yeah. my community? Yeah. And, you know, there were always pockets of friends who were queer or queer affirming, who were trans, um, who loved Jesus. Um, and then over the course of my organizing work, I did encounter another church that seemed to embody a lot of what I really cared about. Um, very Jesus forward, which was super important to me. Um, yeah. My experience in the main line is sometimes there is a reticence to, to talk about <laughs> Jesus, a yeah. lot of talk about God, a lot of talk about love, not a whole yeah. lot of talk about Jesus. <laughs> yeah. And, um, it's yeah. just not for me, you know. I'm like yeah. I'm a Jesus, I'm a Jesus yeah. kind of person. So yeah. Um, so I found this like very Jesus forward Methodist church that was run by um a group of people, many of whom were queer, mm-hmm. and it was a church plant. And I was like, you know, this this really is it. I don't think I had put together really that that the evangelical churches of my adolescence were plants. Like in mm-hmm. retrospect, I was like, oh yeah, mm-hmm. there was like, mm-hmm. you know. It ha- it was new. It was in a church gymnasium, or I'm at a school gymnasium, school gym, you know, yeah, whatever. Yeah. But but in my mid twenties, I was like, okay, so you can just start churches. Yeah. Um, you can start churches with different kinds of leadership, and starting mm-hmm. churches with different kind of leadership produces different kinds of churches. Yeah. And uh, so I was I was really convicted. I I I joined the leadership team, and I started doing a lot of discipleship and small group development, and um. But, you know, in discernment with the pastors, it was very clear pretty quickly, like, I'm called to do this. If I, hmm. if I want a place to go to church, if I want a church in my community that exists for people like me, yeah. I might have to have a hand in making it. Yeah. So I actually had to return to seminary because uh, I, I hadn't been pursuing a Master's of Divinity, which is the degree I needed to do church planting in the United Methodist Church. Yeah. Officially became a United Methodist, went to a United Methodist seminary. And then the winds of church planting energy and funding and uh, expectation kind of shifted and and there wasn't that energy in Chicago anymore. And so I was mm, called up mm-hmm. to Milwaukee, which was a real gift um, because I have a lot of family here. And so I moved to Milwaukee when I was 29 with the names and phone numbers of two people who lived in Milwaukee and told to start a church. Yeah. Um, wow. And so that's... That's how I 
That's how I arrived in in Milwaukee and and planted, became to plant Zao MKE Church. All right. Well, before we jump in more on that, and I thank you, thank you for sharing that fascinating journey for sure. Um, Share, if you would, with our listeners, a spiritual practice or a spiritual discipline that's been meaningful for you or you might recommend to others. Yeah. You know, I think uh, it's, it's a little odd because I, I connect most in community in some pretty traditionally evangelical ways. Mm-hmm. Um, I am, I'm not a, not a hymnal singer. I feel yeah. most alive in worship when the lights are low and, and, you know, purple and the band is loud. Um, and I love the connections in small groups and um, prayer partnerships and things like that. But on my own, the most consistent practice I've had um, probably over the last, you know, little more than a decade is um, singing evening prayer, uh, hmm. a very traditional Lutheran setting of evening prayer by myself, lighting a candle, um, knowing that there are people around the world, Lutherans, Catholics, many more, uh, Episcopal, um, Anglican, who are also doing evening prayer mm-hmm. and, and praying the hours in some form or fashion. So, I think that that's a very, it's a highly liturgical thing, but it's something yeah. that's really been grounding for me. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. I have to ask you though, like as a new church, how many churches offered you hymnals? <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So many hymnals and Bibles that were printed 60 years ago. And yeah, it's a real. Oh, forgive me. Uh, yeah. yeah. Been there, done They're, that. Yep. Um. All right. Well, let's, let's, uh, Let's move on and uh, jump into talking about the story of Zhao MKE Church. Uh, so you kind of you kind of started into it a little bit. Uh, you know, I want to hear about the name. Anything else you'd like to share about the backstory? Yeah. So I'm not. I, I I've not always been great with names. I was a little nervous to name a church. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things I realized quickly, though, is that whatever a church gets named, it it loses it's meaning pretty quickly sometimes as it gets shortened into a set of initials or, or yeah. just shorthand for a community that means something to people. Yeah. And so I, I said, I, you know, I want something um, that, that kind of rolls off the tongue, but also like has a depth to it that people mm-hmm. can talk about that people know where it comes from. So we actually talk about our name quite a lot. Zao, which a lot of folks can't spell or pronounce, um, it's Z A O, and I tell people Zao. It rhymes with wow. Yeah, um, yeah, me, but it is, me included here. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's a helpful it's a helpful device. Um, but it's a Greek word, and it's from the Bible. It means to be among the living, um, hmm. to be fully alive, and it's a word that Jesus uses, you know, many times, including when when he says, "Our God is a God of the living." Um, and I yeah. think it's an invitation to remember that the gospel is not about um, kind of making it through this life on earth and dying and getting a reward in heaven. The gospel is about coming fully alive um, here and now and forever. And I believe that the teachings of Jesus point to an eternal life that doesn't begin later, but is something that we open ourselves to over the course of our faith yeah. you know, as we are sanctified, as we are brought into the fullness of our being, we are made fully alive. Yeah. And I know that from my own journey, I am much more alive now, in, open to, present to, and seeking after the love of Jesus mm-hmm. than, than I was when I was in the depths of um, closing myself off to love from all directions. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, so we decided, you know, this this community is a reflection of our intention to be to be present, to be alive here, now, and forever. Yeah. Well, you kind of shared about you kind of shared about this already in your faith journey, but I, I, perhaps I want to hear it again, maybe for my own sake. Like, why start a church? Like, did you have any idea like what you're tackling there? Yeah, I mean, so I had the benefit of some years of community organizing, which was okay. much better yeah. training for church planting than any of my yeah, seminary that's a good education. Point. Yeah. Um I knew the power of of organizing people together. You know, the scriptures say where two or more are gathered. And and I think that we hyper spiritualize that sometimes, but there yeah. is a power, there is a power to bringing people together. Um and 
so I, it's a difficult task. Um, church planting is an extraordinarily difficult task. And it's one that I went into knowing that whether it succeeded or failed was not necessarily a reflection on my faithfulness or my competence. Yeah, that's um, good. That's good. But just, you know, whether all of the stars would align, whether, you know, I, I like to think about God's invitation a lot. I felt like God was inviting me to be a part of starting something new. Um, and I was going to say yes to that. God was inviting my denomination to be a part of that. And they said yes. And God was inviting all of these people in Milwaukee to come and be a part of it. And some of them said yes. Enough of them said yes. Mm -hmm. And so I think like there is whenever we're organizing anything in the name of the gospel, there's an invitation to all the pieces that need to come together for it to happen. Mm -hmm. And it's about whether we can achieve critical mass. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I was really honored to feel the call to start a church um, and very scared because I knew that yeah. it didn't, nothing was guaranteed. But I truly felt like if I didn't, you know, I love Jesus. I feel extraordinarily connected to my faith. I knew that my faith would be strong whether or not I had the exact right community for me, but mm -hmm. it was still really painful to yeah. be yeah. separated, to yeah. feel alone. And I knew that there were many, many, many more people, especially queer and trans people, who had been so burned and so hurt by the church that trying to connect to God on their own just wasn't going to be functional. Hmm. And so as a person with roots in evangelicalism and an identity in social justice and, you know, queer liberation and, and all these things, I knew that, you know, it, it's not going to work for all the queer and trans people burned by evangelical churches to just suddenly, like, you know, become Unitarians. Like, that's mm -hmm. not going right. to, that's not going right. to, we need, we need spaces that bring together the best of the traditions that we've come from. And we need to collectively heal the wounds that that our traditions sins have caused. Um, yeah. And so I I wanted to be a part of that for myself as much as anyone else, um, but also because I know that there are people who who desperately long to meet God with one another and look around, and the church is just absent for them. Yeah. Yeah, that's fabulous. Thanks for sharing that. I'm curious. Can you give me like a couple practical things about how you see? community organizing, like being beneficial to church planning? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that there's, there's a, a mythology we have in the church and elsewhere that, you know, holding a good program, yeah. um, advertising it on Facebook or in a newsletter, yeah. uh, you know, just having a Sunday morning service is going to bring people in. Right. And I think that that, that that myth gets reinforced over and over and over again when when we say things like oh you know young people are leaving our churches well we need to update our music mm -hmm. um and like sure but like that's not that's not going to be sufficient that might yeah. help yeah. it might not you know it 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 has to be authentic to whatever your community is and so i think that one of the biggest obstacles to growing an organization is this myth mythology that programming alone is what's going to bring people in. Yeah. And community organizing taught me that the, the thing that binds people together for any kind of difficult or demanding or time consuming effort is relationship mm -hmm. is love mm -hmm. is connection is belonging and identity. And so um, I did not rush to worship. I know a lot of people, and some people can do this successfully, you know, um, but a lot of people are pushed by their organizational right. bodies or, right. or whomever to start a Sunday morning worship service immediately. And that's where their resources go mm -hmm. and, you know, over and over again. And, um, and instead, you know, I, I held a weekly gathering at my home where we did um, Lectia Divina and discussions. Basically, I would read the scriptures for folks, we'd meditate on it, then we'd talk about it. But the vast majority of my time was spent in coffee shops, one on one, hearing people's stories. Yeah, yeah. Crashing events, hearing yeah. people's stories over drinks or, or, you know, at birthday parties or at baseball games, and then 
meeting up with them later for coffee to yeah. to talk about it more, you know, yeah. introducing people to one another, talking about meaning and ideas and, um, you know, our past and our future and doing that in these like highly intimate individual and small group ways um, and creating a sense of community that way. So we would mm-hmm. have these one-on-ones, I would connect people to each other and then, you know, we'd have, a barbecue or a game night that where we could all be in the same space, but we didn't, um, we didn't rush to a program because we spent an enormous amount of energy building, building networks of relationships. Yeah. How long can I, can I ask like from when, uh, when you first started kind of going to Milwaukee with that purpose till like your first quote unquote worship gathering? Yeah. So I, um, I moved to Milwaukee in July again with those two like names and phone numbers. I hadn't even met them. Mm-hmm. And, um, but my sister lived in the area. So mm-hmm. she, she was my like, you know, I think some people start church plants with like a little cadre from another church or whatever. Yeah. Especially in the evangelical spaces. Yeah. Yeah. Which is an enormous, right. um, support. I think that right. that's a great way to do it. Um, I don't recommend church planting the way that I church planted, but it was, <laughs> it was what had to happen. So sure. I had my sister yeah. <laughs> and, um, and a couple of contacts. So I, uh, I started gathering people weekly in my home in September. So it was two months of just talking to people mm-hmm, mm-hmm. weekly in my home starting in September. Those gatherings were, you know, two, three, four people sometimes. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we grew that over the course of the year. The the one on ones, the weekly gatherings, the the game nights, um, by the following summer. So it was a year. Mm-hmm. We were averaging twenty five to thirty in okay. in my living room, mm-hmm. and so that's when we started kind of dreaming about worship. Um, so we did preview worship services once a month yeah. um, that fall, and it was but it was a full year and a half before we started doing twice monthly worship. Yeah. And yeah. we did twice monthly worship, you know, for gosh, probably two years, maybe <laughs> a little longer. Mm-hmm. Um, no, that can't be right. A year, a year and eight months. Um, and, and so we did that. We continued to grow doing small groups and tons of events. Um, and we were trying to grow our, we were at a theater. It required a lot of labor to set up, yeah. tear down. Yeah. Yeah. Especially because we were putting a real emphasis on music. Um, right, right. So the equipment, oh my gosh. Um, yeah. I mean, it took us like three hours to set up. Yeah, so, and they're done that. Um, yeah, it's it's rough. So <laughs> yeah. I wanted to go, I think, weekly sooner. Um, but my partner and uh, eventual like co-planter, um, Cameron, who is the musician and does all the tech, was like, no, <laughs> we, are, we need a home. Or right, at least a, right. a slightly better setup before we can go yeah, weekly, yeah. Um, just for volunteer reasons. So we, for a year, for like, you know, a year and several months, we did that, um, growing from an average, you know, like our preview worship services, we came out the gate with 70, 75 people. But right. our weekly, when we kind of, you know, it regulated into um, being in the 30s and then 40s, and mm-hmm. then we got up to you know, 60s, 70s before we decided to go weekly. Um, And through another strange course of events, another, a lot of other organizing principles at play there, actually, Mm -hmm. we, we worked our way into um, a church building less than a half a mile away from the theater we were, we were worshiping at um, in our, owned by our denomination had been sitting empty for years. There are all kind of politics about it, but we, we ended up um, in it and uh, we launched weekly services in October, um, beginning averaging, you know, upper seventies, then eighties, mm-hmm. then nineties, we were worshiping a hundred, mm-hmm. um, on average by February of 2020. Yeah. Um, then what happened? <laughs> then, then there was a little bit of a global catastrophe. So, um, yeah, so we only got five months worshiping weekly in our building mm. before we had to go completely virtual. And due to our, communities needs and priorities we went completely virtual for basically the next two full years yeah um yeah. and at this point um you know in the fall of of 2022 we've only been back in person for about six months mm-hmm. so i, I kind of review that 
just for for my sake and for our listeners. So if I'm hearing you right, um, you went a year, year and a half of just kind of small before any kind of quote unquote formal worship gathering of any kind happened, right? Yep. And then was it another year, year and a half of twice a week kind of, or twice a week, twice a month kind of formal worship gatherings? So that's a, yeah. to use a word, that's a lot of runway. Yeah. I mean, it it was about three years between um, me showing up Mm -hmm. and launching a weekly worship service. Wow. So, yeah. Um, Obviously, you you have familiarity with mainline denominations growing up ELCA and now working in the UMC, correct? Mm-hmm. So I think a, a big struggle that um, at least I see and maybe in, in my context is the runway is not nearly long enough. Never. Yeah. I mean, the reason that I had so much leeway really had a lot to do with a lack of oversight. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm being perfectly honest. You know, there was um, the person who recruited me up to Wisconsin mm-hmm. um, was really my main contact here. Mm-hmm. And he recruited me. He was very passionate. And it was like that person, the bishop knew of me and knew my credentials, but like didn't have time to deal with me. Yeah. And um, and then this person, this member of cabinet brought me up, but then, um, w- then vacated that position unexpectedly a couple weeks after I arrived. Oh, and wow. so the position in my church structure that was supposed to give me oversight and support, um, was vacant for the first eight months. And, wow. uh, and then there was like someone else, technically my district superintendent who was supposed to be over me, who was on medical leave for a lot of that time as well. Wow. So like, I, and I just completely fell off their radar. Even when another person got into that position, I wasn't, I wasn't on their radar. So yeah. I got, um, I'm super grateful. We got, um, we got funding. We got mm-hmm. enough funding to fund my full salary for the first year and a half. Mm-hmm. Um, and then um, slightly less funding every year after that. But, yeah. um, but so I got, I got financial support, enormous financial support from my mm-hmm. denomination. Yeah. But there wasn't a whole lot of oversight. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what that meant was there weren't a lot of denominational pressures. They weren't really they weren't really looking at what I was doing. They weren't yeah. trying to pressure me to move faster than I needed to go. Um, and I did have all my organizing contacts and my other church planting relationships because I had these networks of, of church planters. So I had a coach um, who is somebody who I'd worked with at his own church plant who – absolutely had my back and said, mm-hmm. yes, do not rush to worship. Do not rush to worship. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I had colleagues who had rushed to worship and I saw how much energy and time it takes yep. to put on a quality yep. Sunday morning service. Yep. Um, one of my colleagues was putting on two of them. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. He won in the city and one in a suburb in the afternoon. Wow. Um, and, you know, overall that meant he was reaching more people, but because it was the very beginning of his church planting. Yeah season you know he had 25 at the first service and another 25 at the second but there was like about a 15 person overlap of people who were spending their whole day Hmm. orchestrating these services so i saw how depleting that was yep um yep and uh and yeah i just really prioritized depth of relationship depth of discipleship um and then truly um engaging in very public justice work mm-hmm. and public um, kind of queer space. Mm-hmm. Uh, because the other, you know, there are a lot of factors in, in how Zao was built. And one of them is that we are working primarily with people who have a laundry list of reasons never to trust the church. And yeah. um, so we also just have to move more slowly mm-hmm. um, yeah. in my demographic yeah. and my yeah. community yep. than we might in like, you know, a white upper middle class suburban context, right. for example, which right. is what a lot of church planting materials are geared towards. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Uh, okay. So you mentioned not much nominational pressure and it kind of relates to a question I was going to ask you here. Um, I'll just say like, I loved, or I, I love, I love your branding. Like your website is fabulous. Uh, the imagery and graphics and branding is fabulous. I'm not an artist myself per se, but I love Good branding. Um, to that point, something that I heard myself, and I'm curious if you heard it, was the kind of like 
hey, where's the denominational logo in our branding? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily, I don't think that anyone, uh, again, lack of oversight, I don't think that anyone <laughs> who would be mad at me is actually even knows our website. Um, so there's that. But yeah, I mean, I think what's fascinating, it depends on what you're trying to do as a yeah. church plant. Yeah. Right? Like, And I think that it makes perfect sense. It, let's say you're a United Methodist. You're very identified with United Methodism, but you want to change the denomination. You want to radicalize United Methodists. Great. Mm-hmm. Put, put the logo on. Bring out all the people who are ready to make a change and radicalize the Methodist church. Yeah. But, but that's not my call. That's mm-hmm. not my mission. Yeah. I love, I'm so grateful to be United Methodist, having been Lutheran and Evangelical and whatever. I see so many beautiful parts of each tradition. But I am extraordinarily grateful for the Wesleyan tradition and the theology um, that I was taught um, Mm -hmm. at a United Methodist seminary. But the polity is like, it's crumbling, it's bureaucratic, it is slow. Yeah. People who are identified with United Methodism sometimes are considerably more identified with United Methodism than they are with Jesus, Hmm. um, which again, is just not my jam. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And... uh, and then, you know, you have these profound gaps. So, for instance, in Wisconsin, there is a really troubling uh, history of the United Methodist Church financially and otherwise divesting from Milwaukee and, mm-hmm. and bringing mm-hmm. those resources to other rural, more white parts of the state. Yeah. Um, so, like, the Methodism doesn't mean a whole lot in the city of Milwaukee. Methodism yeah. certainly doesn't mean a lot to uh, people who haven't grown up in the church at all. Yep. Uh, and, and it doesn't really mean much to people who grew up in, you know, an evangelical or Southern Baptist or, right. you know, Wells right. or Catholic, you know. So what I feel called to do is bring people newly into a relationship with Jesus or bring people newly into a healthy relationship with Jesus and the church. And the result of that, we did a poll. um, uh, It was a couple years ago now, um, so we should do it again. But we we did a poll once at Zao asking, you know, if Zao didn't exist, how Mm -hmm. often do you expect you would attend some other religious institution? Yeah. And it was about 12% of our folks said that they would they would regularly attend some other church. Wow. Um, and most said that they didn't, they, they wouldn't go or they wouldn't know where to go. Yeah. Um, and the vast, vast majority of our community was not affiliated with any, uh, any church for years before they became a part of Zao. Right, right. And that's, that's my, you know, that's my little evangelical beating heart there. Like the, the thing that the evangelicals taught me was to spread the gospel yeah, and yeah. to have the story and message and love of Jesus, um, you know, reaching places that it wasn't previously reaching. Yeah. And for me, um, what that means, what I'm called to, the, the gaps that I'm called to meet and love and preach to and build relationship with are yeah. among people who have been alienated or wounded um, or rejected by the church. And so putting, putting my denominational symbol on our, on our branding is not invitational to any of those people. Yeah. It's not even meaningful to most right. of them. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, that's kind of what I expected to hear. I, 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 I'm ordained in the Christian church, disciples of Christ, and we have this, this chalice thing. And again, it, to me, I think it kind of looks more like, to the unfamiliar, like the fragile logo on packaging or, mm, you know, it yeah. just, it, it, again, it, it's just not, yeah. no offense to, you know, folks who are diehard Methodists or disciples of Christ or whatever denomination you are. Like, as you mentioned, like people who are outside these contexts that these logos don't mean anything to them. Well, and sometimes can be harmful, right? So, like, sure, yeah. I'm a United Methodist. Our logo is the cross and flame. Yeah. Right? And so, to a United Methodist, a cross with a flame on it might mean something really great. But, you know, to, uh, for instance, members of our community, black members of our community that have mm-hmm. grown up in white spaces that actually have little weird northern havens of, of the KKK, sure. a burning cross doesn't really seem great. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. There's a lot of uh, conversation in the United Methodist Church being like, hey, our, our logo is pretty tone deaf. Our logo is pretty, pretty harmful in mm-hmm. certain spaces. But the love of Methodism and the, and the kind of like team spirit and cultural yeah. identity has yeah. won out over and over again. And, you know, again, if, if, if your call is to play within the team and radicalize yeah. it and grow it, great. Yeah. Yeah. But if you're trying to reach people who are not already affiliated, um, it can be a real barrier. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, let me, let me ask you to this, if I can, um, I imagine there's plenty of things perhaps, or maybe a few things, I don't know, you can share something you, you would do differently or looking back, you're like, well, that did not work at all. Yeah. I mean, so this is going to be really niche, but like when I was at my first church plant, I, um, I kind of found my place in leadership by doing small group development curriculum and, Mm -hmm. and growth. I started a small group um, and it grew. And so I split it and then it grew and I ended up kind of having a network of half a dozen small groups um, that, you know, I ran a group of the leaders of those groups and then Mm -hmm. they ran their groups. It was this very deep discipleship program um, that had, you know, 50 or 60 people in it. And that felt really great. And I was like, this is, this is evidence that I can, I can start something, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I came to Milwaukee with the plan of basically doing that. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that like the church that I had been in, which was, uh, you know, this church plant in Chicago was incredible. And it, it created a room in my imagination for the possibility that I could be a part of the church as a member or as a leader. But it was mostly reaching people who were more churched. It was Mm -hmm. mostly reaching, you know, straight folks, um, cis folks. And when I came to Milwaukee, I started almost exclude. I mean, like church plants tend to reflect the identities of their planters. Yeah. And um, so as somebody deeply embedded in, in the justice and activism world, I was bringing in secular activists um, as a queer person. I was bringing in a lot of queers as a, <laughs> as a trans person. I was bringing in a lot of trans people. Um, and because of kind of like overlapping identities there, we had a lot of neurodivergence. We had mm-hmm. a lot of folks with disabilities. Mm-hmm. So we had a lot of people who were not, um, who were not prepared to just, jump into a small group and have a prayer partner and sure. pray out yeah. loud and read yeah. the Bible without a whole lot of guidance, you know, like that mm-hmm. just wasn't going to work for them. And I tried it anyway for years. Yeah, <laughs> I tried. I kept organizing these small groups over and over again with the same kind of, you know, hopes and expectations um, and just minor tweaks. So uh, I, you know, I, I wish that I had recognized sooner that my people needed something different. And mm-hmm. I think that there was a lot of pain there because my, my partner and I, Cameron, um, and I were both really passionate about discipleship and yeah. we, and we had found a depth of faith, a depth of connection and support and love in small groups. Hmm. And so we wanted that for our yeah. people. So we we tried really hard to make that work. And it wasn't until literally this year that we started having these conversations and saying, hey, maybe discipleship actually means something different mm. for, you know, a queer and trans person of color who grew up in white evangelicalism sure. who's dipping a toe back into what it means to even be in church with other people yeah. in person. Like maybe the risks that we're asking people to take are the wrong ones and we need to Mm. honor the risks that they are taking as acts of faith and discipleship. Yeah, it's good. And still create opportunities for other people who want to go deeper in different ways. But we need to recognize, you know, what, what risks people are taking to follow Jesus Mm -hmm. and, and really strip away our expectations of what that looks like. Yeah. Yeah. Great observations. Thanks for sharing that. Um, let me ask you one more question here before we take a break. Um, so again, as I mentioned before we start recording, this podcast really takes aim at trying to 
to be a resource for pastors and church leaders trying to renew or bring renewal or new things to their congregation or church starts. Uh, what do you? What would be a word of encouragement or advice to someone who's who's maybe looking to do something new um, within or without or outside of their congregation? That kind of thing. Yeah, I think you know the the world is really attuned to what is possible right now. Mm-hmm. So much so that we got a lot of messaging around what has worked mm-hmm. um, without a lot of faith in what could work. Um, and so I think that, you know, part of being a disciple, part of being faithful is having a prophetic imagination mm. and and opening oneself to the possibility of what God is doing in the world and taking risks. And part of taking risk is knowing that, if you try something, if you experiment, and it doesn't give you the results you want, that doesn't mean it's a failure. And I think that one of the reasons, you know, kind of getting back to that denominational pressure to go to worship, for instance, their denominations invest money into church plants. If they invest money into church plants, they expect a return on every investment. Right. And that's just not how yeah. risky, prophetic, experimental yep. church planting goes. I mean, it's not how anything goes, even in the the business world, right? Ever. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so I I had a colleague once tell me that he considered church planting the research and development arm of the church. Yeah. And that you don't expect that every experiment, every research results in in a banger, you know? Like, (laughs) it's it's about, and we still talk about experimenting here at Zao. We say we're trying something. And, and, you know, even if you want to put it in the harshest terms, failure, so to speak, is is informative. Informative. It is. Um, it's helpful. And so, if we can take risks, knowing that like any information we get from that is a success, mm-hmm. and we have the support to be able to iterate on that and grow from that, I think that's what we're called to do. Is we're called to try. Yeah. Um, and and we really need more support and more cultural acceptance of like, you know, things going many different ways. Well, that's that's a word. I appreciate you sharing that. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, let's take a break and we'll come back with some closing questions. All right, we're back with the Reverend Jonah P. Overton and uh, really, really appreciate this conversation. Really uh, appreciate your perspectives here. Uh, closing questions here. I always tell listeners you can take these, or excuse me, guests, you can take these as seriously or not as you'd like to. Uh, but if you're Pope for a day, what would that day look like for you? Yeah, you know, I think if I were Pope for a day, we've got a we've got a Pope right now. Francis does a lot of interesting stuff, and he'll say he'll say things like, you know, LGBT people are beloved, mm-hmm. and then have to like walk them back. Yeah. So I would just gather all the most radical things, inclusive and affirming and justice-oriented things that the Pope has already said, and I would just say them all in order and be like, I take nothing back. I actually believe this. (laughs) The end. Um, Yeah. Good, good. Um, A theologian or historical Christian figure you'd want to meet or bring back to life? Yeah, so... uh, as a person engaged in, in justice work, and we do a lot of anti-racism work mm-hmm. uh, at Zao, and we talk about solidarity. So, you know, there's the liberation tradition of Christian theology mm-hmm. that has really influenced my faith. Um, as I mentioned at the very beginning, you know, the the political struggles in Latin America and the way that the church showed up to defend the poor. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of incredible theology that came out of that that time as well. And and that liberation theology has really influenced me and black liberation theology in the States. Um, and so we, we talk here at Zao about liberation mm-hmm. and the kingdom being, you know, the kingless kingdom, the, the kingdom, the, the fulfillment of God's intention for creation as being a place where all are made free. But we talk about how none of us can be free until all of us are free. Mm. And that is solidarity. Yeah. And so really, you know, being fully alive, that you know, pursuing that kind of Zao idea, being among the living, um, you can't be fully alive without being among the living, right? Yeah. It's it's not salvation is not an individual project. Yeah. Salvation is 
is what God is doing, you know, for for all of creation. Mm-hmm. And so if we believe that no one can be free until all are free, that no one is saved until the cosmos is saved, yeah, then then we're obligated to do some really um really earthly work of justice and anti-oppression. And when I think about a historical figure um who has really embodied that or or led in that way um but wasn't able to lead in the fullness of of I think what God had intended um I think of Fred Hampton hmm. who was uh a 21 year old uh black panther who was working with um with marginalized black folks latinos um and poor white folks saying hey actually we all have a lot in common. Hmm. We we all need to be in solidarity. Yeah. Um, and and actually, it was this very anti empire. Like it is the powers of domination that pit us against one another. Yeah. And in that very similar fashion, it was Hoover's FBI that uh, murdered Fred Hampton hmm. when he was twenty one. Wow. So uh, I would love I would love to um, you know to give Fred Hampton a second shot, another shot, a further shot at, um, at fulfilling his call to, to unify people around a message of solidarity um, and liberation. Yeah, that's good. Thanks for sharing that. Um, what do you think history will remember from our current time and place? You know, I think there's a lot going on right now. We're in an extraordinary time of transition. Yeah. Um, and I think that we sometimes don't think about um, – how technology is changing us. Um, you know, I'm 35 and I remember, uh, not having the internet in my house. Yeah. Um, I'm 35. I remember, I remember not having cell phone. I mean, I remember my dad getting the family's first cell phone. Yeah. Um, so I think that, I think that the ways that we relate to each other are changing very rapidly. Yeah. And I think that when when people look back on this, you know, it will seem quaint. I mean, like, it will be hard to remember, honestly. Mm-hmm. Like, we think about, I don't know, like, I'm I'm on social media, and I'm a person who probably wouldn't be on social media if it weren't part of my call and vocation. Sure, right. And I said that to one of my community members recently, and she was like, oh, man, you know, there was a time when you didn't have to be on social media to pastor. Yeah. And I and I was like, what was that even like? And the answer is, I could ask my dad. He could tell me <laughs> yeah. what it was like to like to to be a pastor um, with a telephone but no computer. Mm-hmm. Like I have no idea. Um, and that's just you know a generation ago. So I think that I think this is a really pivotal moment for how we relate to one another, how we grow communities, um, and how we gather in order to worship. Yeah. All right, something hopeful. What do you hope for the future of Christianity? You know, I we didn't get a whole lot into this, and folks can hear more about this if they kind of get to those other channels of mine. But um, a, a big part of my understanding of the kingdom is the centering of the marginalized. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that Jesus demonstrates what it means to build a, a community organization, a movement, a church, a um a body beginning with those folks who were most on the outskirts and most marginalized. Um, my hope is that actually through technology in some ways, even through, you know, podcasting, whatever Mm -hmm. access to books and access to, to just different corners of, of the world that the church will learn how to center voices that have been discarded Hmm. or buried. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so on my own podcast, Jonah and the Peacock, that's the whole point is to say, Hey, we're going to bring people with marginalized identities who have radically, radically different experiences of, and takes on faith who read the Bible differently Mm -hmm. than the dominant culture. And we're going to, we're going to bring that, that their stories into focus and tell those stories you know, from our own experiences, listen from our experiences of privilege and learn what it means to follow Jesus from the margins by, by accessing, listening to, 
um, and learning from people who are um, who have not been given the mic. Yeah. Well, that's great. Uh, speaking of, uh, you mentioned your different channels and your podcast. Share with our listeners, you know, what those channels are, how they can connect with you, and uh, learn more about the church if they'd like. Yeah, absolutely. So anybody who wants to learn about the church can find us at zowmke.org. We're also Zao MKE Church on Facebook and YouTube. We have all of our services completely digital as well, and we have a pretty big um, online community that that isn't ever in person in Milwaukee because they don't live here, or, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so zowmke.org. Um, that's also the church's handle. Um, we're on TikTok, which has been pretty fun, um, and Instagram. How I found you, I think, was on TikTok. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then I am um, also on TikTok and Instagram at rev underscore Jonah. Uh, and then, uh, again, we have found that that to reach people, to tell stories, to do the kind of um, radical work of solidarity uh, that that we believe podcasting is is really powerful. And so um, I mentioned my long form interview podcast, Jonah and the Peacock. Um, but we also, Cameron and I, my partner and I have um, uh, a podcast that comes out um, much more regularly. We did like a season of Jonah and the Peacock. We're working on season two right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but we also have this uh, uh sometimes weekly, sometimes bi-weekly, um, short form, uh, called Christian queries mm-hmm. spelled Q U E E R I E S. Keep the queer and queries, um, where we, uh, you know, we just kind of take questions of faith, um, and kick them, kick them around from our perspective as queer yeah. trans people. Yeah. That's a little lighter and a little more fun. Um, but it's, it's a way to, uh, engage theologically again, you know, what our goal was to say, Hey, you know, we have some conversations around the dinner table a lot that, that then come up and people are asking us about and whatever. And like, what if we just recorded it? So hmm. there is this very like, come, come join us for coffee. Come, come sit around the dinner table with us and talk about, you know, what, it, you know, what is atonement and why baptism and um, how do you read the Bible and what are God's pronouns and those kinds of things. So um, you can find us, at Christian Queries um, for that podcast. Awesome. Well, if you haven't already, send me those links and uh, let's make sure we get them in the show notes um, Absolutely. when this comes out. Otherwise, uh, really appreciate your time. Uh, this has been a great conversation. And uh, I always leave folks with a word of peace. So may God's peace be with you. And also with you. Thanks for joining us on the Future Christian Podcast. To learn more about Lauren or the podcast, visit future-christian.com. One more thing before you go, do us a favor and subscribe to the podcast. And if you're feeling especially generous, leave a review. It really helps us get the word out to more people about the podcast. The Future Christian Podcast is a production of Torn Curtain Arts and Resonate Media. Our episodes were mixed by Danny Burton, and the production support is provided by Paul Romaglevitt. Thanks, and go in peace. Peace.